Open Door Baptist podcast features the insightful preaching and teaching of our senior pastor, Jason Murphy. It also comprises of special messages from a number of guest speakers throughout the year. The purpose of this podcast is to be a witness in our community, to encourage others to grow in their relationship with God through the preaching and teaching of His Word, and to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. Go to Romans chapter 1, if you would. Romans chapter number 1. Romans, uh, Romans is one of the great pinnacles in the Bible. The book of Romans, it's a, it's a beautiful book. May, many people that are not even Christians consider the book of Romans one of the highest uh, pieces of literature ever written. Uh, Romans shows where man goes without God. And, and most society gets everything all backwards. They think, of course, uh, we started in a cave and we're uh, getting wiser and wiser and more intellectual and uh, you know, more and more intelligent. And that's actually opposite. We started with God, with intelligence, and the further we get from God, uh, the more ignorant we become. And that's a revolving cycle until God sends a man with the God's message. And, um, and then people repent and come back to God. And God blesses with marvelous intelligence and revelation and tremendous light and industry booms. And, and we have the United States of America as a wonderful example of a, a, great, uh, a, a great spotlight in history. And listen, we need to hold on to what God's given us. It's a privilege and honor to be there in Washington, D.C. And if, if I could explain it like this, if, if Seattle runs on, on coffee and caffeine, Washington, D.C. runs on controversy, okay? So, so don't believe everything you're seeing in the media. It's, uh, it's not exactly uh, falling out quite that way. Uh, in Romans chapter 1, we, we see several different trilogies. And we see three elements of faith. We see three great attitudes that every missionary must have. And we see um, uh, the six steps down that every society goes through. And the end of those steps down is, is change, great change. And that change is culminated in uh, confusion of image, confusion of image. It's culminated in the confusion of the image of God. Look at um, verse 25, Romans chapter 1, verse 25. It says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. That's what we just saw in that marvelous display there in Mongolia. And, and then it goes on, it says, and for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. Not only are they confused about the image of God, they're confused about their, their own image. Now, confusing the image of God is called idolatry. And confusion of, of oneself is, is called immorality. And that is the state of any godless society. So where you labor, where I labor, and where all of these missionaries are going with the message of God, they are going into this state of idolatry and immorality. And, and so how do, we, how do we make a difference? I mean, how can we make a difference in Seattle? How can we make a difference in Washington, D.C.? How, how can we make a difference in, in Mongolia and in Bolivia and... Oh, all these nations, 7.2 billion people. Are we just playing a game or can God make a difference? Well, let's look at the six steps away, away from the light, away from God. Remember, man started with God in a garden, not in a cave in total ignorance. It says um, in Romans chapter uh, number 1, in verse number 21, because that, when they knew God, all societies knew God at one time. And you can just go back to the beginnings. We have Adam. He knew God. 
And then God started over with Noah, and he knew God. And so from there sprung out all these different societies. And so tonight, just briefly, we are going to look at the six steps down and the three steps forward that each of us have to take and will be done. Father, we ask for your blessing and your light into your word, your truth. Father, we are coming absolutely dependent upon you. Bless us with understanding of your word. For the glory, for the honor of our soon coming King, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, the first step away from God is found in verse number 21. Because that when they knew God, here it is, number one, they glorified him not as God. The first step is they don't give God glory. The second step is, is right after the comma. Neither were thankful. If you want to see what the problem is in any given society, they don't glorify God, and they're not thankful for what God's given them. You see somebody that's struggling with an immorality or an identity of uh, properly identifying the Lord Jesus Christ, God, they're not thankful. Uh, when I talk to atheists, and I talk to atheists all the time, I begin listening a little bit, and then I'll often interrupt them and say something like this, so why are you mad at God? Yep. And many, many times they'll just go ahead and answer, and they give a, a pretty good humanistic reason why they are mad right. at God. Right. And, and, you know, when you're mad at somebody, you might uh, be vulgar and say mean things. Or if you're really mad, you might punch them or slap them or something. But if you're really mad, I mean really mad, you'll turn your back on them and you'll say, you're in essence dead to me and you'll ignore them. And that's what an atheist is doing. Everybody knows there's a God. Yep. Everybody knows there is. Sure. But they glorify him not as God, neither were thankful. And here's the third step, but became vain in their imaginations. Vain, in th that means empty. And they start um, uh, all this foolishness. But their foolishness looks very wise. Look at this. And their foolish heart was darkened. That's where the bright brilliance of the glory of God is exchanged for darkness. And, and men and women in societies begin groping in confusion looking for God. And it's the exchange of light for dark. It's the exchange for this dark heart. But it actually looks really good. Look at verse number 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became what? Fools. Fools. So it looks really wise. It seems very intelligent. We've got all these great words and, and all these diplomas and all these things. It looks like a lot of, uh, of study and intelligence, but it's actually complete foolishness. And then the two steps that we already discussed, they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image like unto corruptible man. So it's an image, an identity crisis. That's what all societies have. And that's what missions is all about. Bringing the light of the gospel to help people with the identity crisis in any given society. And that identity is we've got to identify God and we've got to identify ourselves. And if we can't, it's idolatry and immorality. So what are we going to do? Well, uh, you know, social media is pretty good, and, and the printed page is pretty good, and, and uh, funny jokes, if I could think of some funny jokes, that would be good too, and, and friendliness, and charisma, and, you know, um, you know, all these things. Man, those are all great things. But it really comes down to the attitude that Apostle Paul has. And maybe the greatest missionary that there ever was gives us his attitude. The attitude that God can bless. The attitude that God wants to use in my life and in your life, wherever you're serving, wherever your field is, wherever God wants you to put your hands on that plow and be steady and work with God. Well, here it is. Look at verse number 14. Apostle Paul is going to give us his three secrets. Maybe we could call it the three I am's of Apostle Paul. Verse number 14, we're in Romans chapter 1. First he says, say those first three words with me. I am debtor. 
Now that is a huge secret. If you're taking notes, write that down right now. I am debtor. That is exactly opposite of what every human sees themselves. They see themselves as victims. As victims. As a matter of fact, every society thinks that they are being taken advantage of. But Apostle Paul goes exactly opposite, and we must follow this lead as revealed by God. It says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Being a debtor is an act of humiliation. I don't know if you've ever been in debt before. How many would say, you know, I've been in debt before? I've been in debt before. Okay. When you're in debt, if you're going <laughs> to, yeah, that, that's right. When you're in debt, there is, a, there is a, a feeling, there's an emotion of desperation. You're like, I want to get out of debt. I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to take some risks. I'm willing to work two jobs. I'm willing to pay some overtime. I'm willing to do something I really hate doing. I'm willing to, to suffer and put up with all sorts of junk. Amen. Why? Because I'm a debtor. You know, when I first got to um, uh, Capitol Hill, I really felt like uh, the politicians were living a, a, a life of wealth and basking in um, uh, the sacrifice of the American people. And, and uh, that was quickly, that attitude was quickly changed when I went door to door and, and several very prominent members of Congress opened their door. And I gave them a track. Wow, oh, this is, this is your house. Uh, I went to their office and, and many of them actually uh, sleep on, on little cots in their office and don't even have a house, and, um, and, and then go downstairs to the gym there and take a shower and work out and that sort of stuff and, and change and just, just have very few clothes. And, and their family lives in the district and, and they work in their office. And you know what? They are, I have met some am an amazing amount of true patriots and people that are, that are serving their country. And, and to our shame as Christians, I can say this, they are serving with vigor and believe with all their heart in what they're doing. Uh, by the way, Capitol Hill is filled with people that believe in what they're doing with all their heart. And it's not just the good guys. It's the other guys too. <laughs> I mean, it, these are eccentric, self-sacrificing people that are doing what they're doing because they believe in it with all their heart. This is Missions Conference. This is like mission, Missions Impossible. This is like, guys, we have got to get serious and stop playing games. This is not about, uh, this is not buying a big bed. This is about getting a little caught because uh, Paul said this, I am debtor. What can I do without? How can I minimize what I'm doing? How can I be more effective? I am debtor. Now, for a Jew, this is a major uh, a statement of self-humiliation and desperation. You know, when you feel like you owe somebody, you're going to take these extra measures. Now, when, probably when you walk down the street, you don't look at somebody, especially somebody that doesn't look like you, whatever you look like, and they look a little bit different for whatever way. You don't look like, you don't feel like, I owe them. You probably feel like, you owe me, and you're taking advantage of me. And what are you doing on my sidewalk? <laughs> no matter who we are, we all feel this way. Paul said, no. The Christian attitude, the attitude of of a missionary is I owe you. I owe you. I'm willing to embarrass myself. I'm willing to seem desperate. I'm willing to humiliate myself because I am in debt. What is he in debt of? Well, he's going to talk about that in just a second, but it, it's the gospel. I owe you the gospel. I owe you the gospel. I've got the gospel, and now I owe you the gospel. And we need to feel in debt to the heathen. Amen. Do you feel in debt to the heathen? The second element is found in the next verse, verse 15. So as much as in me is, say those next three words, I am ready. He says, I am ready. I am ready to preach the gospel 
to you that are at Rome also. The second element, jot it down, is I am ready. Ready speaks of preparation, maybe qualification, uh, taking some steps to make sure that you can deliver the goods. It speaks of expectation. It speaks of anticipation. I'm ready. Have you ever seen somebody that's ready? Or maybe this is a better question. Have you ever not been ready? Oh man, I hate not being ready. Oh my goodness. And you're just like humiliation galore. But Paul said, I'm ready. I cross-reference that word ready. In Titus chapter 3, it means quick. It means like on the spot. Like just add water. Instant. Here we go. In 1 Peter chapter 3, it means prepared. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, it means willing. And that's what we need to be with the gospel. We need to be quick, prepared, willing. On the go. I'm deader. I'm ready. Look at verse 16. It gives the, the third thing. And say it with me, the four words. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And that's what he's getting at. It's the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now this is identification. This is the element of identification. I don't know if you've ever been embarrassed. I get embarrassed pretty easy. My wife doesn't get embarrassed. She embarrasses me. And I'm like, oh man. And she's like, don't worry about that, okay? Uh, identification um, when you identify with someone or something, it allows you to have boldness and, and confidence. When you identify with something over here, and then you're over in another area, you feel awkward, embarrassed. Like the first time you came to church, and you didn't look like all the people in church, you felt weird because you didn't identify. Uh, when you went to a rodeo and you were not dressed like a cowboy, you kind of like, oh, I don't fit in here. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, identification. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed. Why is he not ashamed? Because he's identifying with the gospel. He's identifying with Christ. And so therefore, he says, you know, I am, I'm a debtor, I'm ready, and I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You know why we get ashamed? You know why I get ashamed? It's because I'm identifying with something else rather than the gospel. I'm identifying ethically. I'm identifying uh, religiously. I'm identifying uh, ethnically. I'm identifying financially. I'm identifying maybe in some other way. And now when I'm in this element, I'm like ashamed. I'm out of place. But Paul said, I'm not out of place. Because I'm identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he already promised he would never leave me nor forsake me. And so we take the gospel and we're sent and we've entered into the, uh, uh, into the labor with Christ. And this is not something we're doing for him. It's something we're doing with him. And pretty much he's doing all the work and we're just along for the show, along for the ride. I'm not ashamed. That's what Paul said. Okay, now that's the attitude. But what is the essence? What, is, what are the nuts and bolts? What, what is the very substance that brings change to a given society? It's actually found in the very next verse. Look at verse number 17. So 14, I'm dead, or 15, I'm ready. 16, I'm not ashamed. 17, the essence of our gospel message. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, and here it is, from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now that is a quote from Habakkuk chapter, chapter 2 and verse number 4. It's mentioned here in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 17, in Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 11, and Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 38. Each one brings out a separate element of how the just shall live by faith. But that's another message. Right now, I want to tell you that God wants to use your faith. God wants to use your faith um, to unite in this missions program. I liked what 
what pastor said that uh, that those that are giving uh, pray maybe you need to give more maybe you need to be steady those that haven't started giving maybe you need to jump in follow the Lord but it's according to our faith it's faith to faith faith is an amazing thing you know Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17 faith why don't you quote it with me so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God so faith what it comes faith comes then in 1 John chapter 5, in verse number 4, faith does something else. Faith overcomes. Turn there with me. 1 John chapter 5, in verse number 4. The Bible says this, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world Say those last three words. Even our faith. Faith comes by the hearing of the word of God. And faith overcomes. Listen. As you hear the word of God. As you hear uh, the truth and the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Faith enters into your heart. And then you have to on purpose with your will believe and place that faith in something hopefully it's not a church and a pastor although you got an awesome church and an incredible pastor holy smokes that's 10 bucks no <clears throat> you put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and then that faith is going to overcome now how many of you are aware of something that needs to be overcome in your life today. Let me see your hand. You're aware of something. All right. So faith comes, and here, you got to hang on. Faith overcomes. Now, missions is point three. So faith comes, faith overcomes. Look at missions. Point number three here. We're back to Romans chapter one. We saw it already in verse number 17. By the way, faith comes in Romans 10, 17. And look at this other little number here. Romans 1, 17 is how faith is, is transferred to somebody else. It's how faith connects. Faith comes, faith overcomes, and faith connects, and it's contagious. Missionaries, as you go, it's not necessarily going to be your gospel tracts, although you should use them. It's not necessarily going to be the words you speak, although you need to speak words. It's going to be your faith. Look at it in verse number 17. Where... For therein is the righteousness of God revealed, say it, from faith to faith. From faith to faith. You're going to run into somebody and they have a measure of faith and your faith is going to connect with the faith there. And God's going to, that faith is going to have a little arc, a little faith arc. And they're going to be like, whoa. They believe. They see your faith. Just like what happened when we saw these, these two great presentations. Whoa. Whoa. They really believe God can save Bolivians. Whoa. They really believe God can save Mongolians. And they believe God's going to use them. And it was contagious, wasn't it? And you went, I believe that too. As a matter of fact, I want to get involved. And that's how God works. So Paul, Paul said, I'm a debtor. I'm ready. And I'm not ashamed. Because faith comes. Faith overcomes. And I get over junk in my own life. And then faith connects and it's contagious to other people. And what happens? God begins to work in a, in a process bringing societies back to him. And what is it for? It's for the glory and for the honor of Jesus Christ. So God wants to receive glory through you and me. And God wants to receive glory through these heathen societies. These heathen societies have a rich tapestry of culture. It's complete ignorance and immorality. And God says, I want to bring them out of the rich tapestry of their own dark heart and bring them into the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. And so this missions conference is all about this. It's about glorifying God. It's about, 
It's, it's about the faith and the power of the gospel reaching out into a society that has fallen and is completely immoral and has some major image problems about themselves and God. And we live in one of those societies. And you know what's going to change it? Your faith. Are you reading the Bible? Are you receiving faith? Are you overcoming? And are you contagious? Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Pastor, Pastor, would you?